Good morning and welcome to Hope Fellowship. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning to worship together through the hearing of the word and spending some time in prayer together. As Pastor Jeff will come in a little bit and uh, give a welcome and pray with us and then Kevin will be bringing forth the word. My name is John Trott. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope and I trust that you got our newsletter that was sent out on Friday and we're able to listen to some of the music that was on either Spotify or YouTube. And uh, we're able to worship in that way to begin or after the service, after the preaching of the word, to continue to engage with your heart. If you did not get the newsletter, send us a note at info at myhopefellowship.org and we would love to get you connected that way. Thank you again so much for joining us this morning. Well, good morning, Hope Fellowship. My name is Jeff Brewer, and I'm one of the pastors here. For our call to worship this morning, we remember that it's Palm Sunday. And it's in John chapter 12 that it's only after Jesus' death that it says that the disciples remembered the significance of what happened, his death and his resurrection, his glorification, that they remembered the significance of what happened on this Sunday when Jesus rode in on a colt that there were people surrounding him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king. They were worshiping him as he rode in. It's the Sunday before Good Friday, when Jesus would lay down his life, or as he predicts on Palm Sunday, when he's talking to the disciples later in the day, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, into the ground, and dies, it can bear no fruit. It remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus knew on Palm Sunday that he was headed to the cross. The Pharisees said to one another when they saw the crowds worshiping him, See, the world has gone after him. And yet... They had no idea what was to come, what they meant for evil. God intended for good for him, for Jesus to lay down his life for, a, in a sense, the, the grain of wheat to go into the ground, to rise in newness of life on Easter Sunday, and to bear a harvest of souls that all those who would believe in him would come to know him, not just in Israel, but all around the world since that time. And so for 2,000 years, we've been celebrating on this Palm Sunday. We have been, and churches and Christians have been saying as they meet, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we marvel that would God would have such a plan that would involve this week leading up to the cross, all in the events at the cross, and three days later, Jesus rising from the dead. Do you believe this? Do you believe in Jesus alone for salvation? Is he your king? Do you worship him as Lord? That's our prayer. And it's our prayer, especially in this time of trial, that we would be Christians seeking to follow after him, that we would be Christians who would be bold, knowing that it is only in Christ that we have hope for resurrection from the dead. And so if you're here for the first time, we want to pray for you. We want You can fill out a comment card below. There's a link below this video um, for regular attenders and members. We'd love to hear from you if there are ways we can be praying for you specifically. But if you're a first-time visitor even to our site and to this worships, online worship service, we'd like to pray for you as well. So you can fill that out. But let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come together here this morning. We thank you that Jesus is worthy. He is supreme. He is worthy of the worship that the people gave to him on that day as he came into Jerusalem, and he is just as worthy now because he is God, the God the Son, eternally worthy of praise. 
We thank you that you hear our praise and our prayers. We thank you that if our belief is in Christ, you have brought us into your kingdom and you're our king. We thank you as well that you understand our weaknesses because you sent your son, born of a woman, born in the flesh. He understands weakness. He understands suffering and trials because he walked the path before us. He identified with us, knowing the frailty of our flesh. And he knows, as you know, as our God, how greatly our attitudes can swing in the course of one week, even one day. Jesus walked the path with palm branches on Sunday, and by Friday, he was despised and he was counted as a transgressor, hung between two thieves and in the grave. We pray for your strength to bear up under trial, that we would be steadfast, and that we would be enabled by the Spirit to stand firm. We pray for the, those of us here at Hope, as a local church in this area, as Christians who gather together, that we would use these means of grace that you have given to us, that we would fellowship together, that we would not neglect the meeting with one another as we are called to do, even though we have to do that virtually. We thank you even for the technology to make this possible. We pray that we would also engage with your word in new and fresh ways, that we would take time to pray, to seek you, we do pray for those in our congregation who are serving in health care and in essential businesses during this time. We pray that you would give them strength in the midst of many hours, that you would give them sharpness of mind as they interact with the myriad of patients that they're seeing every day. We pray for their families who are home, some with small children who might not fully understand, some who might be full of fear. Would you draw near to them in a special way in the precious few quiet moments that they have. We pray that for all of us, Lord. We pray for that for ourselves now as we take this time to quiet our hearts. As we spend time together virtually now, that as we have this time in the word, that we would be attentive, that we would seek to grow, that you would draw our minds and hearts towards you in a special way. We thank you for Kevin and his willingness to step in and preach these last few weeks as our pastors and elders have sought to care for the flock and set up for this new reality we find ourselves in. And we pray now, Father, that you would open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your word, that you would give us understanding that we might observe your word and keep it with all of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Hope Fellowship. It's good to be with you via video again. We are continuing this morning in our study in the book of Philippians, looking at chapter 4 today. Before we get, get to that, though, I want to just talk about nature for a moment. Nature can certainly, as we all know, have a fury. On the West Coast, they have earthquakes. In Florida, hurricanes. In the Midwest, tornadoes. And so for those who own buildings, whether that's companies or people, the concern is how well will their buildings stand up against the forces that nature throws against it? Will the building stand firm? Will the house stand firm? Will the office building stand firm? And so because of this, engineers, architects have put a lot of time and effort into understanding what helps buildings withstand powerful forces. They've learned to use better materials, and they've learned to, to put to those materials together in better ways. They've learned the importance of strength, but also the importance of flexibility, especially when it comes to uh, dealing with earthquakes. And the hope here is to make more, home more houses and more office buildings able to stand firm the next time a natural disaster strikes. And just like how nature throws a lot at our buildings from time to time, life throws a lot at us and our faith. This is true at any time, but as we are in this moment in our history, it 
is especially true. But the good news is that Scripture speaks to this. A consistent theme in Scripture is the need to stand firm in the faith. It doesn't just say that. It's a, it gives us some, some clues into how to do that as well. And so at the start of today's passage, the Apostle Paul addresses this idea of standing firm. Now, our whole passage is Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9. I'm actually going to start just by reading verse 1 to begin with. It says this, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Now, this one-verse paragraph is transitional. Paul begins with the word, therefore, which points back to what came previously. And he says, therefore, stand firm thus in the Lord. So, everything that we talked about last week, pressing on toward the goal of Christ, remaining faithful and teachable, imitating the example of godly people and conversely not imitating the example of ungodly people, and also remembering our heavenly citizenship. I would say that all this is wrapped up in, or at least contributes to our standing firm in the Lord. Especially, I would say that the therefore refers to the fact of Jesus' coming return and his ensuing display of power in resurrecting our bodies and in subjecting all things to himself, as it says in 321. That, that fact, Jesus' return and his power, that is powerful reason and motivation to stand firm. But the grammar in verse 1 here in chapter 4 suggests that Paul is also about to explain more of what it means to stand firm. And note, too, that what he says here applies not only to standing firm in our faith as individuals, but also corporately. He's talking about standing firm together in our faith as the church. Now, what follows in verses 2 through 9 is probably one of the most loved, most memorized, and most turned to passages of Scripture. It is down to earth. It is practical. It's simple, but it's not simplistic. It's straightforward, but it's also incredibly rich. These are lessons that we will take a lifetime to learn. And these are lessons that we have right now in this moment. We have an opportunity to relearn and to put into practice, especially given that it's so challenging to do so. And so what we'll see is that another key component to standing firm in our faith is the development and practice of three important virtues or traits, peace, joy, and holiness. Let me go ahead and read the rest of our passage, verses 2 through 9 of chapter 4. Paul says this, I entreat Euodia and I entreat, entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Indeed, may the God of peace be with us all in this time. Well, beginning in verses 2 to 3, the first trait or virtue that the apostle points to is peace, specifically peace in relationships. Now, this, this trait is particularly uh, relevant to our, our corporate standing firm. If you remember, as we've gone through the book of Philippians, a theme of the letter is unity. Remember, at the end of chapter 1 and starts in the beginning of chapter 2, pa Paul talked about one spirit, one mind, having the same mind, and same love. He then, in chapter 2, described what unity looks like. 
It involves putting off selfish ambition and conceit. And in their place, we're to put on humility. Part of this is considering the needs of others better than those of our own and looking to the interests of others. And then Paul, remember, points to Jesus himself as the perfect example of this sort of humble attitude and action. And let me just, here's application right away. Again, I'm, I, I realize I'm, I'm going back to chapters 1 and 2, but, but he picks up this theme here. These are stress-filled, anxiety-filled times. And as much as we may love our families, most of us are probably seeing a lot more of them than we're used to. And that may be causing conflict. So let's use this opportunity to practice the humble servanthood that Paul puts forth in chapter 2 in our families, in our homes. Well, again, in chapter 4, Paul returns to this theme of unity. And here he moves from sort of general exhortation to a specific situation. He mentions a disagreement between two women at the church in Philippi, Euodia and Syntyche. Now, we don't know the exact nature of this conflict, but it must have been significant. After all, Paul heard about it several hundred miles away in prison. And also, he calls them out for it in a church-wide letter. The reason for this is probably that the conflict had spilled over and was affecting the unity of the whole church. And this spillover is a danger in any situation, whether it's in a family, a workplace, or the church. Something that's between two people can, can easily boil over to influence others. It's important to note also that this dispute, this disagreement, was not between immature Christians. Paul respects these women. He says in verse 3 that you know, they had labored alongside of him in gospel ministry. The lesson is that even mature, committed Christians are not immune from conflict. And it's something that each of us must be on guard against. We all need to know how to best prevent conflict and how to deal with it in a biblical way, in a godly way, when it does come. Well, even though Paul is at a distance, he's far away, he, he the... He has a pastoral heart, and so he steps in to help resolve this situation. And look at how he handles it. First of all, he addresses both women. Now, it's not clear to us, again, from just what's written here, it's not clear to us who's at fault in this situation, or perhaps who's more at fault. The way Paul approaches it, though, it doesn't seem to matter, because both women have a Christian responsibility to seek unity, to seek peace, to seek reconciliation. And here's an important application for conflict. It's easy to focus on what the other person needs to do while at the same time neglecting our role either in causing the conflict or in bringing it to an end. But the fact of the matter is that we can only control what we do. We can't control what the other person does. And we have a biblical responsibility as, as followers of Christ to avoid and to minimize conflict. Romans 12, 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Well, having addressed both women, Paul now pleads for them to agree with each other. The phrase could be translated literally, be of the same thinking or, or be of the same attitude. Furthermore, he calls, he calls for this agreement, quote, in the Lord, in the Lord. And this is really key. It is the Lord himself who is the reason that we are to pursue unity and peace in relationships. We're called to do so in obedience to him and out of a desire to please him. We also are to pursue peace in response to all the things that God has done for us, all the things we've received from him. First and foremost is peace with us and God. Back in chapter 2, you'll remember that when Paul talked about unity, he, he grounded it in saying, if you've received all these benefits of Christ, encouragement, comfort, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, these, these sorts of things. So the, so the benefits we receive from Christ are a motivation uh, and an engine for pursuing unity. In Christ, we are one, and we are called to live that out. And the Lord himself is the way in which we achieve unity and peace in relationships. First of all, by remembering that he's the motivation for it, as for the reasons just listed. Number two, by adopting his humble servant attitude. 
And number three, because of the supernatural power that's available through him. In this last point, the supernatural power that's in him, it raises another theme of Philippians. Namely, it's God's work in his people. In the Lord, we're able to do things that we can't do in our own resources, in our own strength. We see this in uh, the famous verse of chapter 4, verse 13. Paul is talking about contentment, how he's learned to be content in every circumstance and situation. And this is what he says regarding that. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Remember also, in back in chapter 1, it was in the Lord that, that other Christians grew bold in preaching the gospel in spite of Paul's uh, imprisonment. At the start of chapter 3, he told the Philippians amid suffering to rejoice again in the Lord. Command that's repeated in today's passage. Let's be honest. Some conflicts we face, trying to resolve them, might cause despair. It might seem like an impossible situation for us. I just can't do it. I can't love this person. I can't forgive this person. I can't make peace with this person. I just can't do it. Well, maybe not. But in the Lord, you can. Paul's not finished here, though. After addressing the two women, in verse 3, he asks someone else to come in and help. He addresses this true companion. Now, we don't know exactly who this was. Probably a good guess would be a church leader there in Philippi. Clearly, it was someone that Paul trusted. Sometimes, we need outside help in order to resolve conflict. A third party can be objective and less emotional. He or she can mediate by helping each party see the other party's point of view. When we find ourselves in conflict that's not getting resolved, it is wise to get someone to help. On the flip side of that, we ourselves need to be willing at times to serve as mediators. And this goes against our natural tendency for most of us. When we see conflict in the church, we may say, that's too bad, but we'll stay out of it thinking, well, that's not really, not really my business. Now, that may be true in some cases. We don't want to be busybodies, but it is probably not true as often as we think it is. If a dispute is not getting resolved by two parties on their own, depending on our level of relationship with them, it may very well be our business. Because as we've seen, unity in the church is crucial. As Jesus' disciples, remember from the Sermon on the Mount, were called to be peacemakers, especially within the body of Christ. That's what Paul himself does via this letter, and that's what he, does this, what he asks this other person to do. Well, let's talk some application. It's straightforward, but it's also difficult. It's the same for us as it was for these two women in Philippi. Agree in the Lord. We do this because of him, and we do it through his power, relying on him in prayer. Now, we also have to keep in mind that this does not, agreeing in the Lord does not mean absolute agreement on every single issue. The way the New American Standard translates this phrase is helpful, I think. It says, live in harmony in the Lord. We know that in certain musical arrangements, different singers sing different parts, but they come together in, in beautiful harmony. Likewise, we can be different. We can have different opinions, but we can still be in unity in Christ. Being of the same mind in the Lord is a disposition, it is an attitude. And we achieve this by going back to the principle of chapter 2, namely embracing humility following Jesus' own example. This means that we need to be willing to be wrong. We need to be willing to examine our motives. We need to listen, to have empathy, and try to see the other person's perspective, looking to their needs as well as to our own. And as we see here, it means allowing others to help mediate conflict when that becomes necessary, or even seeking out mediation and help. And then finally, when we see ourselves unresolved conflict somewhere else, we need to be, seek to be peacemakers by offering to help. Peace in relationships. I would urge us all to not just consider this exhortation, this command, in the abstract. If you are in conflict with someone right now, 
you need to follow up on this. You need to act on this scriptural command because, remember, again, it is part of you and our church standing firm in the Lord. Moving on to verses 4 to 7, the second trait to help us stand firm is joy in trials. Joy in trials. Paul, has, having addressed this situation between these two women, he now turns his attention back to the whole church. And he gives four commands in this paragraph. One, rejoice in the Lord. Two, let your reasonableness be known. Three, don't be anxious. And four, instead, pray. Now, each of these commands is valuable and worth paying attention to on its own. But I think that the context of this letter ties these commands together. They're related to one another. Well, what is that context? Just a little refresher for us. Remember, Paul is writing from prison, where he's awaiting trial and potential execution. Furthermore, in his imprisonment, or while he's in prison, there are rival preachers trying to cause him distress. The Philippians themselves are suffering and facing opposition because of the gospel. Epaphroditus, their friend, nearly died because of, or because of his gospel ministry. There are potential threats to the church from both Judaizers on the one hand and antinomians on the other hand. And Paul, throughout the letter, has talked about sharing Christ's sufferings. So we see that common thread here. The common thread of this circumstance is suffering, which is, both, which is very real to both Paul and the Philippians. And so, as Paul begins to close his letter, he offers guidance on how to stand firm, how to live as heavenly citizens, specifically in the face of trials. Okay, but why these four commands in particular? Well, they all, I think, apply to trying situations. Let's unpack this. First of all, trials are not enjoyable, and they can tend to absorb our attention and take our eyes off of Jesus. And so the exhortation is, rejoice in the Lord. Next, I don't know about you, but whenever I face trials or difficult times, I can get cranky. It's harder to be loving. It's easier to be annoyed. And so Paul says, let your reasonableness be known. Next, trials breed anxiety. We worry about situations, about people, about the future. And so he says, don't be anxious about anything and pray about everything. That's kind of the, the, the gloss over quick view of the four commands taken as a whole in, this, in the circumstances of trials. Let's, let's look at each of these commands a bit more in detail in turn. First, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And just so we don't miss Paul's point here, he repeats it. Again, I will say, rejoice. And I would say this repetition probably comes from the very fact of the trying circumstances that they are facing. It's, it's counterintuitive, and so it bears repeating. And as, early we, as earlier, we noticed the important propositional phrase that he adds to this, that adds to our rejoicing. It's in the Lord. Just as the Lord is the source of our strength, he is also the source of our joy. Further, he's the object of our joy. And Paul gives just one of many possible reasons for this in verse 3. This, this could be o easily overlooked because it's attached to the conflict between the two women at the church, but it, it, I, it really flows into verse 4, and it's important that we see it here. He refers in verse 3 there to fellow workers as those, quote, whose names are in the book of life. They're in the book of life. Regardless of what we endure in this life, Christians have salvation and all that comes with it. Furthermore, we have the love of God in intimate, unending relationship with him. And also just remember verse 12 from last week where it says that the Lord has, has made us his own. He has taken hold of us. And so because of all this and more, which we could spend hours unpacking, because of all the truths of the gospel, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. And Paul's not just being an ivory tower theologian here. Remember, he's in prison. He's, this is very real for him. Rejoice in the Lord, but there's one more modifier here. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Really, Paul? Always? When I get the cancer report from the doctor? 
when my marriage falls apart, when my boyfriend or girlfriend dumps me, when my loved one dies? Yes, always, and continually, which is implied by the verb form that's used here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, wait a minute, Paul. You, you're not familiar with our situation. Are you saying we're to rejoice always, even in the midst of a worldwide pandemic and, and, and sort of you know, stay-at-home order and a, a, a burgeoning financial economic meltdown? Remember, this isn't just Paul. It's God through the Holy Spirit. It's there in black and white. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Begs the question, how can we possibly obey this? I asked myself that this week. How can we obey this? And how can I possibly preach this when, to be honest, it's not really what I'm feeling. Again, I point all of us, including myself, to the ability to do amazing things through Jesus' power and aid. I think we need to keep that in mind. It's in Jesus that we are able to do this, his strength, his power. But there are some more contributing factors as well. We are able to rejoice now and always, even if this pandemic gets way worse than it already is. We're able to rejoice now and always because the Lord never changes and because of the benefits of salvation that we have in him never change. And that's the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness depends on our circumstances. True joy depends on the Lord. Joy can remain regardless of or even despite our circumstances. Now this is not to deny the reality of pain, nor to deny the fact that, that, that mourning and sorrow are sometimes very appropriate. But because joy is, un, is in the unchanging Lord, rejoicing, even in the midst of mourning, is always possible. Well, how do we cultivate this kind of joy? What practical things can we do to help us rejoice in the Lord always? Well, I would suggest that we do it first by keeping our focus on the Lord rather than on our circumstances. I don't know about you, but I'm, I've become a little bit obsessed with the news lately. I check it in the morning and in the evening and all day long. My computer is on. I'm just like checking updates, updates, updates. Well, maybe I would do better to be obsessed and keep my eyes on the Lord rather than being obsessed with whatever the new news is. We do it by confessing and repenting of sin that hinders our relationship with God. We do it by expanding our vision of God, by reflecting and meditating on his character and on all that he has done for us in Christ. We do it by being careful, and I think this is important, especially at a time like this, all times really, but we, we do it by being careful to consistently praise him for who he is and what he has done. Rejoice in the Lord always. Well, the second command in this paragraph is in verse 5. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And NIV uses the term gentleness, which I think is probably an easier word to relate to. Gentleness is, of course, the opposite of harshness. It means showing consideration, kindness, forbearance. The word here was often used about kindness when retaliation might be the expected result. Of course, some people are easier to be gentle towards than others. Your grandma, a little child, another person who's also kind. But Paul says here, let your gentleness and reasonableness be clear to all, all without discrimination. And so this implies that this is where to show gentleness or reasonableness even when we are dealing with our enemies. Because after all, the Bible teaches that the Lord Jesus himself was gentle. And so gentleness is actually evidence of his work, his character being formed in our lives. Being reasonable, being gentle, will also contribute to the peace and the unity that Paul talked about earlier. And, and I think it's probably something to be mindful of in our current circumstances. Well, the next sentence begins, the Lord is a hand. ESV connects, connects this with what follows. But in the original, it's actually unclear whether it refers back to being gentle 
or whether it refers forward to being anxious, or perhaps, and probably most likely, it refers to both. Either way, what does it mean that the Lord is at hand? There's a couple different possible interpretations, and each of them provides a motivation for obeying. The first is that his return is near in time, which, as we talked about last week, is a motivation for godly behavior. The second possibility, especially as it relates to not being anxious, the second possibility is that he's near to us personally, now, by his presence. Again, either of these interpretations provide motivation to be gentle, on the one hand, and or to be free from worry, on the other hand. The third and fourth commands, we've said there's four here in this paragraph, they're found in verse 6, which is probably a familiar verse to many of us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And again, in these circumstances, I confess I find myself inadequate to preach this to you other than as a weak vessel who desperately needs to hear this himself. Trials naturally cause anxiety, but anxiety is not what God wants for us. The reason is that anxiety betrays a lack of trust in God. Jesus made this clear in Matthew 6 when he says that God knows our needs, he cares for us, and so we shouldn't be like the pagans and worry. So the antidote to anxiety is prayer. By praying and making our requests to God, we entrust the situation into his hands. He's in control anyway, whether we realize it or not, and by praying, we acknowledge that fact and try bring that truth to bear on our own hearts and minds. As we think about this dual command, don't be anxious, pray, there's several other things that I think are worth noticing here. First is the totality of it. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And I think this just points to the, the wonderfulness of our God. Nothing in our lives is too big or too small to bring to him in prayer. Second, the attitude, which is communicated here by the words that Paul chooses. Prayer denotes a worshipful demeanor. Supplication indicates an expression of neediness, of dependence. Thanksgiving means that we're not treating God as a vending machine. Instead, we're showing gratitude for what he's done for us, even as we bring to him new requests, new concerns. Even when our situation's desperate, there are several things that can help us be thankful in our prayers. First of all, the very fact that we have a loving Father who hears and invites us to pray. Second, we can remember times past when he's heard our prayers and he's seen us through various situations. And third, we can just trust because scripture says so that he will oversee our current situation and he will meet our current needs. Those are all reasons to be thankful as we bring our concerns to him. One further observation. Note the promise given in verse 7. It says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is a wonderful, wonderful assurance. And I'm sure that many of you can testify to times when you've experienced this in your own lives, this kind of peace that really doesn't make sense other than taking God into the equation. This peace transcends our understanding because our natural understanding tells us worry, be scared, panic. Having peace in difficult circumstances, again, is, is counterintuitive. Furthermore, this peace of God, this peace from God, is beyond understanding because it's supernatural in nature. It guards our hearts and our minds from attacks of the enemy who would, make no mistake about it, sow doubt and fear in times of trial and stress. Well, hopefully the application has been pretty self-evident as we've gone along and unpacked this paragraph. These commands are for all of life, but they are especially applicable in trials. We're all in this current trial, and some of you may be facing additional trials that are personal to you on, on top of it. God, through Paul, says rejoice, 
Show gentleness to others. Don't be anxious, but instead pray. In this way, it is possible to have joy and peace even during trials. The third trait to help us stand firm is found in verses 8 through 9. Holiness in thoughts and actions. Let's look at verse 8 first where the command is given. He lists several qualities there and he tells the Philippians, think about these things. And that word think isn't just sort of a fleeting thought. It has the meaning of ponder, dwell on. It's thoughtful reflection. And as was the case with the command to rejoice, the verb form here also indicates continuous action. So, so this thinking about these things is a pattern that we're to develop and practice on a regular basis. Our thought life, the things that we fill our minds with, is important because actions spring from thoughts. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, taught this. Murder springs from hate, adultery springs from lust, and so on. So submitting our thought life to the Lord is an important part of our discipleship. So what kinds of thoughts? Well, the things Paul says to set our minds on are described with eight adjectives here. True, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. Now, we don't have time to unpack each of these, but I think we could sum it up very uh, concisely by saying what he's calling for here is holiness in our thought life. Now, an immediate application, well, okay, well, how do I think about these things? Well, an immediate application is notice that all of these adjectives, they describe God. He is the ultimate fulfillment of these qualities. And Jesus, of course, is the, is the fullness of God. And so we, we think about the Father, we think about the Son, so let, us minds, let our minds dwell on God and his qualities and his ways. Having said that, that's kind of the baseline. But even though we live in a fallen world, there are also many other things that these adjectives describe, although imperfectly. And Paul says to think about these things. Furthermore, the first part of that, dwelling on thinking on God, helps us be more attuned to whatever is true and honorable in our world, in things and people. Now, a further application is that if, we are, if this is a set of things, the description of things that we are to think about, there are the converse is true. We're not to fill our minds with the opposites of these adjectives. Again, because our, our thought life has influence on our behavior. Garbage in, garbage out. So what are the opposites? Well, the opposite of true is false. The opposite of honorable is shameful. The opposite of just is unjust. The opposite of pure is impure. The opposite of lovely is ugly. Of commendable is despicable. The opposite of excellent is poor or, or terrible. Worthy of praise, the opposite of, is worthy of criticism. As you think about these negative descriptors, I think we can recognize that, sadly, much in our world today holds these things up, these types of things up, as things to think about. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what am I filling my mind with? Is it good, healthy things, things that are pleasing to God? Or is it bad, unhealthy things that are displeasing to Him? We need to be more intentional about setting our mind on godly things. And we also ought to consider if there are things that we shouldn't think on. For example, what kinds of TV or movies or books or music are we consuming? And do we look any different from the world in this area? Now, I'm not advocating legalism, but instead I am suggesting intentionality, wisdom, discernment, and good judgment. I would also suggest that this, this idea of, of pursuing holiness in our thought life has a specific application here in this situation. I think it's a spiritual truism that when we are facing stress, when we are squeezed, 
that we can run to our favorite pet sins. And some of those sins may involve our thought life. And so again, I think that's something we need to be on guard about in this current situation. Well, after calling for holiness in thoughts, Paul goes on in verse 9 to call for holiness in actions, and he puts himself forward as a model. He says, follow his teaching, follow his way of life. And of course, as we've said, holy actions spring from holy thoughts. Now, while examining our thoughts and actions in this way and making changes may be difficult, there's a benefit to it that Paul talks about. If we pursue holiness in our thoughts and actions, Paul says this, and the peace, excuse me, and the God of peace will be with you. We will more deeply experience God's presence among other good things. And he emphasizes that God is the God of peace, which is, and peace is broader in the Bible than mere absence of conflict. It is broader than even freedom from anxiety. Peace is shalom, it is well-being, it is life as God intended it to be. So, peace, joy, holiness. As we incorporate these qualities into our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit, you and I will be able to better stand firm in the Lord, experiencing his supernatural peace, regardless of of what life throws at us. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this part of Ephesians, which I know is a, is a favorite of many, and it is a favorite because there is such awesome uh, truth contained here and such awesome wisdom contained here. Lord God, uh, we want to stand firm against the, uh, the violence that life throws at us. Help us, first of all, to, again, go back to remembering Jesus' return and, and eagerly looking forward to that day. But then these three virtues here in this passage help us, Lord, to, to pursue peace in our relationships. Help us to rejoice. We need your help. We need you to fill us with joy in Christ. And we also desperately need your help to give us freedom from anxiety. Help us to, to take all our concerns and, and, and just bring them to your feet. Further, may our, may our thoughts, may our actions be pleasing to you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again, Kevin. It's been encouraging to me to hear the word of God preached from Philippians and as we've engaged here these last couple of weeks at the end of chapter 3 and chapter 4, God in his goodness and in his sovereignty knew exactly where we would be, not when we started the series, not knowing all the events that would be taking place in our world. I love how he pointed us to there, those, those four commands. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your reasonableness be known to all. Do not be anxious about anything but by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Especially appreciated how he connected those four and so how they kind of build on one another. Because I think that's what we need today. We need to hear the command and the call to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. We need to not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, make our requests known to God. We have a God who hears us, who listens to us. We can draw near to him because we have a Savior who is interceding for us before the Father in the throne room of heaven above. And so Hope Fellowship, for our benediction, may you hear the benediction from the very end of Philippians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Go in great joy and peace trusting in him for hope.